All right. Shalom, Brother Onia. Shalom. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing good. It's great to finally be able to do this with you. Yeah, I, I know we've talked about this uh, over a year ago, I think. Mm, I'm not sure if it's been that long. It was over in California. So I've been on, back on hmm. Florida now for nine months now. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, but I know uh, recently you had suggested, I think it was a good idea. I think some people might would, would like to get to know a little bit more about yourself. I know uh, 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 it's definitely been fun interacting with you in the Q&A and, and hearing your, uh, hearing your uh, explanations for some and your point of view and uh, hearing your knowledge about the Dead Sea Scrolls and the various uh, scriptures. And uh, I think it'd be great for us to go over some questions and, and uh, help others get to know a little bit more about yourself and, uh, and why you're here. You know, so yeah. when, when did we first uh, begin interacting or when did you first become familiar with me and what so, I, who I am? So I first heard about you with Brother Jackson. Uh, it was like like five, about six years ago. And uh, he was telling me about a young fella that uh, had a re really, really like a gift basically for filling in uh, like for, you know, when people for the Dead Sea Scrolls and for like ancient texts where there's parts missing and he felt like you were a savant in like figuring that stuff out. And, uh, and he was uh, interested in getting to know you more and stuff and getting your information out there and and uh, that's what first intro one of my first introduction was to you. It was like literally five or six years ago. Okay. Yeah, it's been. But a I didn't time. look into you much. I but I did see you would have the Dead Sea Scroll religion videos that you would put out, going about different parts. And one of the vi video series that really caught my eye was the Book of Jubilees, mm -hmm. a Jubilees, because I find that to be a real one of my favorite extra biblical books that uh, wasn't included in canon. We never finished that series, but that was fun. That, that was fun going through that series. Yeah, so one of the things I want to find out about you or, you know, one of the things I like to start off most conversations is, uh, you know, for you to talk a little bit about yourself and your testimony and, uh, you know, how you got to where you are today in your walk with the Heavenly Father. Well, I was raised in traditional Christianity from it, within the Protestant movement. And I was raised specifically in the Episcopal Church with a Baptist backdrop from my family. And there was one key event in my high school years which really shaped my search for truth. And that was a a philosophy class in my high school, which the teacher was trying to encourage us to think, to question what we've been taught, question what we believe, and don't assume anything that we were told is true necessarily, but to try to seek for evidence and just to adopt the stance of a, of a, of a rational skeptic. And that really resonated with me because I, I had a sense that if anything I believe was true, I should be able to prove it's true and defend it. Because there is a passage in scripture which says, be ready to give an answer for why you believe what you believe. Right. So that really resonated with me. And I felt like in order to give an answer to everybody about why I believe what I believe and and proof that what I believe is true, I need to study the evidence and try to prove everything about the Bible. I wanted to prove everything about the Bible is true. So that set me on a quest to learn the Bible in a much deeper way than I ever had before in, in, in my younger years. So again, this was in high school when this, when I started really seeking deeply into the scriptures. So I would look online, <clears throat> excuse me, I would look online to uh, different 
websites looking up answers to questions I had. One of the other things that I did was I got for Christmas a study Bible of the NIV translation. And the study Bible had amazing, what at the time I thought they were amazing, footnotes or like notes of commentary where the compilers of, of the notes, they basically asked a bunch of people questions. They, they asked a bunch of people questions, uh, like the most common questions that people had when reading a certain passage. And what, they collected the questions and the most common questions were included in the study Bible of the NIV. And so when I was reading through the this study Bible and looking at all the note, like the questions that people had, I wanted to find answers to each of these questions. And so I would do research online and try to try to come up with my own idea about why something was the way it was in scripture. That's cool. And I, what I really liked about the setup is most of the time, not always, but most of the time, it didn't tell you what the correct view was. It usually said, some people believe this view, others believe this view, and still others may believe the third view. But while they differ, the common ground between all these views is, and then, you know, they'd, they'd say the common ground. And I, I like that approach because it left it to me to figure out for myself what to believe on each of these subjects. Nice. So as I was going through the study Bible, I came upon a few foot, a few questions such as why does Jude quote from the apocryphal book of Enoch? Yes, that's and, a great one of my favorite <laughs> questions to bring up. <laughs> and, and instead of saying, oh no, he doesn't do that, they said he quotes from it because or something along those lines. And I was like, wait, what? He's quoting from a book of Enoch what is this book of Enoch it, it exists so that made me curious because the way I saw it if Jude is quoting a text as a prophetic then that text must be scripture so it just right. immediately yeah. I see your logic I I, ne I was never indoctrinated into like because I was still a teen uh so I didn't I didn't go to seminary and all that stuff. I'm sure I would have been indoctrinated at a certain point if I had, you know, kept up with learning from the official church authority. But uh, looking at, like, I came into the idea of what is scripture. They had never talked about canon with me before. Like, they, they never really talked about how there's all these other books. I mean, they talked about the, the Catholic church, how they had some extra books. But they didn't talk about all these hundreds of other books that existed and, and that exist and that and that the Bible writers themselves quote these books as scripture, as prophecy. So to me, the Bible always takes precedence over what the church says. Yes, uh, sir. That's right. And so when I saw what Jude said, that was mind blown to me. And that set me on a quest to find out what the true canon is of scripture and it's funny because i would go to high school and instead of doing my homework so all right so at home instead of doing my homework i'd be looking looking up stuff online about scripture then when i when i was at school you know i would do my homework during the class that it was due trying you know co copying answers from other students and um <laughs> and uh so, sometimes uh you know the teacher would be reviewing the homework that we did last night and as we were reviewing it i was answering the question <laughs> so uh, but then what we we often during classes instead of paying attention sometimes we had to use computers for different projects or for assignments so instead of doing my assignment i was looking up stuff online about scripture <laughs> and uh during study halls if i got the chance i would go to the computer lab and again look up stuff about scripture so i probably printed you had a passion 
Yeah. And one of the things I was most passionate about was what is the canon? What, what book should be included in the canon? So I can't tell you how many lists of canons that I printed off from the high school library printer. I must have printed like a <laughs> hundred different canon lists. Nice. Yeah. So, and each of them, I, I would tinker around with them. I would say, hmm, I think I'm going to include this in my canon this week. And then next week I'd be like, oh, may, I'll put this in the maybe list. And I don't know. It was just, it was fun to just to, to uh, theorize about which books might be scripture and why, because I, I was trying to wrestle with it and say, hmm, well, this book probably is not scripture because of this doctrine that I find objectionable. You know, I was really wrestling with it. And, but that's where, what really got me into, into the extra books. But then, so I decided to, I want to, I wanted to attend Liberty University, an evangelical Christian college. And I wanted to be a, I wanted to be a family and marriage therapist. And also I, I, so basically in the beginning of the, as I was approaching the semester, I wanted to double major in uh, family and marriage therapy and Bible uh, education or whatever. I wanted to major in them both. So I loaded up my classes. I had 18 credits. And then after like the first week, I started going through a ethical crisis, spiritual crisis where I couldn't really focus on my work, uh, schoolwork as much as I wanted to. So that my, my work slacked a lot because of that, but I still did. Okay. You know, uh, I passed most of my classes and the thing is, uh, basically after one week, I started feeling guilty about the food I was eating because it was all, for every meal you could have an all you can eat buffet and you know breakfast lunch and dinner you could have pizza cheeseburgers tacos soda any you know whatever you wanted at any time and i started thinking wait a minute this isn't healthy and then i was thinking how can i justify this type of behavior when i personally at the time and i still do I condemn as sin smoking and other and uh, being a drunkard and being gluttonous because of its negative health effects uh, on the person. So I was realizing that I was judging these people, looking down on them for doing these unhealthy things, even though I was doing unhealthy things and not judging myself. So I realized how much of a hypocrite I was being. So that kind of made me realize. I need to find out what's healthy to eat. And I wasn't sure what it was healthy to eat. So I was like struggling through my ethics. And basically whenever I would eat, I would feel guilty. And because of that, I would try to eat as little as possible. So I was kind of not really eating that much. I would try to find something I could eat and there wasn't a lot. So I, it was a, it was a tough time for me. And I was really depressed during that time because for me, if there's something that really, that's really plaguing and affecting my mind back then, anyway, this was much more uh, impacting my emotional state. Nowadays, I don't feel as impacted by those type of things. But at the time, it was just completely debilitating for me. I couldn't function. I, I felt hopeless and my life felt dark because I did not have the answer to this issue. So I asked around to all the people I looked up to. I said, uh, can you please help me explain this to me? I don't understand. Most of them gave, didn't really give adequate answers. I mean, none, none of them really did, but uh, most of them didn't really give much of an answer at all. But there was one person in particular who gave an answer that was not intended as, excuse me, it was not intended as the answer that I took it as. 
but it was life changing for me. So basically, the, the second part of the answer I'll tell you first, and that is he was saying, you're not going to go to hell for, for going to McDonald's and eating junk food. Come on, you know, like, but that wasn't my question. I, at the time when I was, when I was trying to figure this out, I didn't care whether or not I was going to go to hell for it. What I was focused and concerned on was as a believer, you know, I, even, even when I was a Protestant, I never once felt that it was okay for me to sin and that I shouldn't worry about it. I shouldn't worry if I sin, it's okay. It's not a big deal. So to me, it was always, if, if, and when I did sin, I'm supposed to repent and turn from my sin. I ne not out of an I, I never thought of it as an idea of I had to do that to be saved. I just felt that that was the, that was what you're supposed to do. That's the right thing to do. And why would I do anything else? I, I should, I should want to do that. And I did want, I wanted to be a good person. Cause if, you know, it feels good to, to be a good person. So I was like, okay, well, I'm not concerned about going to hell for eating McDonald's. That's not the point of my question to you. I, I, I was thinking, you know, I'm like, I just want to be obedient. I, I want to be doing the right thing. And I want to be healthy too, you know, cause it's, it's important to be healthy. So, right. um, but the first thing he said to me when he started answering was he said, I assume you're not talking about kosher. And then he, he did his answer about McDonald's, but that initial statement, I assume you're not talking about kosher really opened my mind because it made me remember, Oh yeah. Kosher is what the Jews do. And that's from the old Testament. So my whole thing was, what does God want us to eat? I just wish God would tell us what he did not want us to eat. And I realized he did tell us it was in the Bible the whole time. And I didn't realize it was under my nose the whole time. Well, that's interesting. So then I was like, I need to find proof to, I need to find scripture proof to support the kosher laws. Cause I'm sure this is, I am convinced that this is the answer that I need. So I want to find scripture to support kosher laws and I want to find science to support it as well. So I started looking for scientific evidence as well as scripture evidence for the food laws, the kosher laws that led me to messianic websites and those messianic websites shared their view that other parts of the law were also still for today, but they had not been abolished and they quoted prophecies and passages which were clearly post Messiah and yet still had the application of the law for those certain laws, like Sabbaths and holy days, like the Feast of Tabernacles during Zechariah 14 and all kinds of things. And I was blown away by all this. And I also saw circumcision was still important. So that pretty much convinced me to become a messianic a believer of the torah as well as the messiah so i started living like a jew not a, not a, a pharisee jew but just you know a messianic jew trying to obey the torah in the context of the messiah and i started watching some youtube videos in 2010 early 2010 from a ministry which is a ministry of street preachers i don't know what they do what they're doing currently in the age of covid but uh, uh in the past they would go out to colleges to beaches everywhere and they would try to preach the gospel i think in many ways their work was counterproductive but i think they also brought a lot of people to the knowledge of the messiah so I think they, they were used, despite their methods, I think they were used for good, even though they did cause probably some bad as well by pushing some people away, further away. Uh, but for the good that they caused, I, I, I was particularly influenced by them in some of their videos. And I started watching some videos about Paul where 
basically they showed evidence that what Paul taught was very different than what we believe he taught and that he actually taught we had to be sinless to be saved because this was something I struggled with um, while I, I only was at Liberty University for one semester and after I started following Torah I realized I couldn't go back anymore but during that one semester I started struggling also with the passage from first John which says uh, if anyone sins or if anyone continues to sin he is a, not a child of God he's a child of Satan and that bothered me because that to me was a pretty in, it was a strong indication that if we are in sin then we are not saved but I was conflicted because there were passages of Paul that made it seem like that the opposite so I, I reconciled it by saying, okay, Paul, maybe he means, maybe he means we had to stop habitually sinning in order to be saved. I mean, maybe John, uh, maybe John meant that in first John, we had to stop habitually sinning. But after I watched the videos of this outreach group, showing that Paul taught the same as John, I realized, no, it's saying that if we sin at all, if we willfully sin, we won't be saved. So that very much made me in awe and, and realize that I'm not saved due to my beliefs. And so I try to tell people online about my new revelations, new discoveries, but no one listened. Uh, everyone turned a blind eye to what I was saying or a deaf ear because they didn't like what I was saying in it. And they, they automatically res resorted to Paul says otherwise type of logic. So, but I didn't need other people to believe and agree with me. I just knew for myself. Well, so that was a path I was on. And then I entered a relationship with someone online in 2010 of that year, and it only lasted for a few months, but after it ended, I was devastated, and it, it, um, it forced me into a very dark and depressive state where I was, I, I never was actively planning suicide, but it, I was just struggling with suicidal ideation, with, which is just, you know, just uh, thinking about suicide and wishing that you were dead type of thing, but not necessarily choosing or planning to, to kill yourself. It's just preoccupation with those thoughts and uh, considering what it would be like and thinking maybe it would be you know, part of you wants to, but then the other part of me would say, no, if I do that, I'll go to hell. So I, I could never do that. That was one of the big things that kept me from not doing that is because of my beliefs that this would get, condemn me. My whole reason for being depressed was because I was concerned about my, the state of my soul. So it wouldn't make sense for me to kill myself. That would be counterproductive. Right. And I was always told, of course, Suicide is a permanent solution to a temporary problem. So I would say that, you know, I, I never was really like tempted to kill myself in the way that some people are for, you know, who struggle with suicide thoughts. But, but still, you never want to be at that place where you're even, where you're even thinking about it. And, but I, I was there. Um, Whoops, someone was trying to join in. Hopefully he comes back. This was Sean that was trying to join in. Um, but yeah, so during this time, I, became, I basically became a philosopher and I philosophized some really heavy stuff. And I basically decided for myself the meaning of life. I discovered the meaning of life for myself in a way that helped me realize okay, you know what, this is the meaning of life. And so now I don't have to struggle with this anymore. 
basically what I was struggling with at the time was um, certain questions like, well, basically I came to believe that if you sin even once after being saved, you lose your salvation and can never be saved again. That's what I came to believe. So I was like, this is serious. I'm scared to be saved because I don't want to lose my salvation. And so I wanted a list of every single sin that exists. Unfortunately, the Bible doesn't give you a list of sins. It just tells you some sins. It gives you categories. It gives you generalizations. But it never really gives every sin. And it never, it never really gives you the, uh, a... It doesn't really explain why something is sin. A lot of people think it's something's a sin because God says it's a sin. But I think it's deeper than that. And so I wanted to know why are things sin? Why is it wrong? Because if I know why sin is sin, then I can know, I can say, okay, here's the sin equation. If X and Y, then Z. The idea is you can look at any situation or anything and evaluate it and ask yourself, is this action guilty of this? If it is, then it's sin. If it's not, then it's not sin. And so I came upon my own conclusion on that issue. But what was really struggling for me with that is, is this idea of like, for example, what does it mean to be lazy? You know, how much can you play until it's, until it's, uh, until it's not considered lazy? It was questions like that, you know, because I wanted, I wanted, I wanted the perfect down to a T. I wanted everything to be black and white, where it was, oh yeah, this is sin, this is not sin. So it's like, how much can you not be doing something important and just playing around or just relaxing before it's considered sin because you're, you are, you are being lazy. So that was troublesome to me a lot, and. Let's see what was the other thing I don't know it was just there was just so many things that you I wanted to know the right answer and not knowing the right answer made me feel like I was lost and hopelessly lost so I felt like I needed the answer oh I know what I was going to say here here's Here's the struggle I was having. It's, have you ever seen the movie Castaway? It's, it's, uh, with, with, with I've Tom, seen, no. Tom I've Hanks. Seen the ending. So basically, he's, he work, you know, he's in the real world and he works for like FedEx or something. And then he's on a plane for a business trip and then the plane crashes onto an island and he he's stranded on this island, so he has Just no. Just him and his beach is a volleyball, right? Yeah, Wilson. Yeah. <laughs> so he he doesn't have any interaction with humans. He only has animals and such. And then I saw that scripture talks about how animals can sin, plants can sin, stars can sin. So, and, you know, of course, angels can sin too. And I was thinking, how can these creatures sin and be righteous? How? I'm, I was struggling to comprehend how this could be. Because I was thinking, what sin could someone do in a state where they're just stranded on the island and they can literally not do anything? What sins can they commit? If it's just the human, if you're, if you're deprived of all human interaction. And then I was thinking, well, what if you're like, you know how some people are in basically in like a coma or they are, there's something called locked in syndrome where you're in a coma, but you're actually fully awake, but your body is paralyzed. You can't move. You can't communicate. Everybody thinks you can't hear them. And you're just, you're just lifeless in your body your body's alive. It looks like you're not aware of anything, but you actually are 
but you just are just sitting there and lying there all day to your thoughts. So the question entered my mind, how can you uh, sin in such a state like that? And how can you be righteous? And that really struggled with me because I really struggled with that because I felt like if, if in those situations you could be guaranteed to be righteous, then that's unfair. Like that makes it so that it's guaranteed to be saved for certain people and not others. Uh, it just, it wasn't making sense to me. I didn't understand. But I came to a conclusion that not only is righteousness about, you know, the physical world, but it's also very much about the philosophy and the beliefs. It's much about what you believe. So I believe that every creature is required to do philosophy to try to discover the truth about the way things are. Be they animal or plant, they have to think about the things of the divine. At some point in their life, they have to start thinking about these things and, and really think of of why things are the way they are. And that, that'll lead them to worshiping the creator because we have to worship the creator to be saved in my understanding. So these were th questions I had. And, and then around this time, you know, because I was, like I said, I was investigating the canon. And so that led me to the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls led me to becoming basically an Essene adherent the Essene, ancient Essene path. And then I started really getting interested in the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. And I've adopted a lot of the Ethiopian Orthodox ideas into my faith. And I've discovered some really interesting things involved with the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, as well as the Dead Sea Scrolls and putting it all together. And just so many amazing studies I've made over the years I also did not work or go to college for from 2010 all the way. Actually, I did have a job in 2011, but since 2011, the, the fall of 2011, I quit my job. No, I was fired, excuse me. I was fired from my job and then I did not have a job or go to school all the way until 2017. So, so that would be what, six years? So six long years of not working. Instead, I devoted my time full time to studies of scripture. And of course, when I say full time, I, I did in, entertain myself with different things, but I wasn't particularly doing video games much at that time. And I wasn't really watching many movies anymore. But I, I would listen to music, like Messianic music and things like that. Uh, so that was pr that's pretty much how I came to be what I am today. It's that's interesting. a long, so, long was introduction. It that, was that knowledge of uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls and it was, uh, is, that what, it, is that what helped get you uh, out of that depression? That no, deep? because I had to, I basically had to the scriptures were not giving me the answer that I was looking for because I wasn't looking for a scripture answer. I was looking for a philosophy answer and scripture doesn't do too much philosophizing. It does some, but it doesn't really get to the core depths of philosophy that, that I was craving. I was wanting to know why it's wrong, like, and, and trying to know so I could apply that rule to everything. Like for example, Let's say murder and rape, you know, because those are heinous. Everybody knows those are heinous things. But the question, we, no one questions why, no, no one questions that they're wrong. But we, but many times philosophers, and I was one of these people, was trying to, to understand why is murder wrong? Why is rape wrong? Not, again, not because I was like tempted to do those things, but 
trying to understand the philosophical basis of ethics. And to do that, I would use these horrible crimes and sins as an example to think about, to try to think why are these things wrong? And then how do I apply the, the principle here to other things? And scripture doesn't really get to that. It just kind of says, thou shall not do this. This is wrong. This is evil. You know, it, it, you know, you can you can extrapolate some principles from scripture, but it wasn't giving me the full depth I was looking for. So I basically I I there was one moment where I was sleeping in my bed, and while I was sleeping, I kind of had like an epiphany. I think it was like when I was like in between sleep and awake, I just started having this a thought came to my head, that's the answer I'm looking for. And, and the, the idea was uh, to, I, I think it was something along the lines of respecting the rights of people. Um, sin is basically disrespecting the rights of someone else, of their mind in particular, their rights. And also, I just concluded that it was, in particular, it was dis disrespecting the rights of your own mind and what was har harmful to yourself. It sounds simple when I say it, but it's very profound, the disrespectful to the rights of minds, because what it means is something on the lines of, of anything that is contrary to a mind is wrong. So what are things that are contrary to it? Well, murder is contrary. But why is it okay sometimes to kill some creatures? Because in those instances, when you're killing something, it's not contrary to that mind's life. For example, if, you're, you, if you kill a creature for food, the food is being used for life, to sustain life. So it's not contrary to the nature of minds to kill for food, to kill for self-defense. It's not contrary to the right, the nature of minds. The nature of minds is to live. And so the killing for self-defense falls within that uh, classification of preserving the nature of minds. Also, uh, you know, if someone commits a horrible, heinous crime, the death penalty should be given to them according to Torah. Why? Because the existence of that mind being alive is an affront to other minds because of what it did. Its actions made that mind in, in opposition to the, the other minds that are alive. Their heinous actions are directly contrary to the nature of minds in such an extent that their very existence of life after committing those actions is contrary to the goodness and nature of minds. I'm saying it on the spot. If I were to, if I was to type it up in like in a philosophy document, it would be more, it would be better put together. Yeah, I'm um, following you though. And when I was thinking about these things, I was very much in a philosophical, philosophical state of mind. So I was using philosophical language. I haven't thought in that kind of mindset for a number of years. So it's still, it's kind of, uh, I'm kind of out of it in that sense, but that was the basic gist of it. It's, it's the contrary to the nature of minds, you know, uh, homosexuality is wrong because it's contrary to the nature of minds. The, the way the, 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 it's the design is clearly uh, for male and female some creatures actually are designed with a single gender, a, a common worms. gender. Mainly it's worms and things like that. But for those creatures, homosexuality is not a sin because that's their design. Their bodies are specifically designed with that idea of a single gender in mind. Uh, but for humans, it's clear that that was not the design. So to go against that is to go against the nature of minds, to go against the nature of life itself. 
And so that's the basic principle I was applying and it really helped me. But I also, I also came upon a, I want to look it up. Uh, I, I actually have it in, I think I have it in my email. I'm quickly looking it up. Do you still hear me? Oh, yeah. Okay. The reason I say that is because my browser was blacking out. Um, so what's the next question while I'm looking this up? So what would you consider? So I think you already answered the question, but what would you uh, consider yourself as far as like if someone asked you what your religion was? Yeah. So for a while, like I was, uh, it was funny, like when I was a Protestant, then I kind of, for a small amount of time, I was saying, oh yeah, I, I'm a, uh, I'm a Catholic now. I never joined the Catholic church, but I was kind of saying, oh yeah, Catholic. Uh, then like a, like a week or two later, I'm like, nah, there's stuff I don't like about Catholics. I'm going to call myself a, a Eastern Orthodox. And then I was like, eh, nah. And then Oriental Orthodox. And then um, I was like, no, not Oriental Orthodox. Finally, I came upon Messianic Judaism. Then I was like, you know, maybe I'll call myself Nazarene Jew. So I was calling myself Nazarene Jew for a while. And then there was like the whole, well, you know, I'm not a Jew because it's not just Jews, it's Israelites. So I was calling myself a Nazarene Israelite. And then in 2011, 12-ish, was when I really started identifying with the Essene religion. So I started identifying myself as an Orthodox Essene Jew. And I identified for, by that designation probably from 2011 to, let's see, it would be 2000, 15, 2016. So we're thinking we're looking at four to five years of identifying and living strictly as an Essene. And I mean strictly, you know, like I said before, I was keeping Sabbath super strict. So I was very much living as an Essene the best I could. You know, the Essenes were supposed to live in community and I didn't have a community. So I was living in an Essene by myself with my I lived with my parents, but I wasn't interacting with them much at all. But I was very lonely. But I uh, bet you were. Yeah. Eventually, I came to conclude that the Ethiopian Orthodox Church is the authentic continuation of the Essene religion. Because the Essene religion is much more of an Old Testament. It was very close to New Testament times, but it, but it pretty much is an Old Testament religion. And so the, when the Messiah came, he instituted a revival or reform of the faith of the Bible. So the question is, in the context of the Messiah's new covenant, what are we supposed to be? Are we supposed to be Essenes or are we supposed to be something new? And so I came to the conclusion that Ethiopian Orthodox basically are the new Essenes. They're the, they're the Essene Christians, basically. So my religion currently is essentially a mixture between it's a mixture between Ethiopian Orthodox and uh, Essene Judaism, and mix it in with a little bit of um, let's see here. Make, you know, I believe in nature. When I say I believe in nature, I mean I believe in a universal religion of nature, that all religions stem from the religion of nature. You know, Paul talks about, does not even nature teach you the things of God and the righteousness? So I think nature in itself constitutes, in some sense, a religion because it teaches you values and laws of the way things are. Science is very much part of the of the religion of nature, you know, um, 
many times believers kind of uh, dismissively call, say that atheism is also a religion type of thing, you know, oh yeah, atheism is a religion too, or, but it kind of, in, in some ways it kind of is, but I'm thinking more towards science. Secular science is very much in harmony with, with the religion of nature. And when I say that science, I don't mean, I don't mean what the scientists say. I mean, true core science, the actual real facts of the world is I think authentic religion. So I try to incorporate that. And, uh, and as of recently, since 2019, I've started trying to also incorporate the, the Mesopotamian uh, context. So that would be the Babylonians, the Canaanites. They had a lot of values and beliefs similar to what the scriptures say. So I think uh, they're important for filling in some of the holes of scripture. So Interesting. Any, Interesting. let's see here. One second. <clears throat> I'm going to quickly search for this. It's basically uh, I remember certain words. If you remember certain words, then you can like you can find like when you're doing a search in your email, right? You're like, oh, I forget where it is, but I know these words. When you know the words that you've said before, then you can discover, uh, you can find it much easier. So what I said is, uh, well, at one point I divided all things of life into three categories. I, I, I came upon this due to some things in scripture in the Apocrypha, the Testaments of the Patriarchs in particular. So I came upon the way of the mind is knowledge, power, and emotions. So it's basically um, the power to think, you know, to consciousness and to learn. Power is like the will making choices and skills, learning, uh, learning skills and emotions would cover love and hate. What should you love? What should you hate? And so that all things in life fall under those categories of knowledge, power slash will and emotions. And then I basically said, the meaning of life Wait a minute. Okay, I, I did more than one meaning of life, I think. So this is, this one here, I said, the meaning of life is to cultivate true knowledge, true power, and true love. The idea is, because all things in life boil down to those three things, knowledge, power, and emotions, so Throughout your life, you should try to learn as much as possible. You should try to like know as many things as possible, I mean. So you should expand your knowledge as much as you can about as many important things as you can. Then you should try to become as powerful as possible. Try to become as powerful as you can. So learn skills, learn languages, uh, exercise, uh, and become a more powerful person. And then love, expand your abilities so that you can love more and more people and more and more stronger love. And one of the ways you can know, the more money you have, the more good you can do to help others. So uh, by cultivating those things, basically trying to become like God himself. What I mean by that is God is all knowing, all powerful and all loving, right? So we should try, knowing we'll never make it, we'll never reach God's level, but we should always strive for perfection. 
we should always strive to be knowing everything. Yeah. We should strive to be know-it-alls. We should strive to be super, super people. And we should, yeah, I was, I couldn't think of a good joke for the rest of it, but uh, of course we don't want to be know-it-alls in the bad sense. Uh, it would be humble. Yeah. But we should strive on a personal level to know the truth of the important things of life. I had to go to my other email account because I know it's in my other email account. The other definition that I was going to give you. So while I'm looking that up still, what is next on our list of questions? So what what was it about the Dead Sea Scrolls that you found so fascinating? What got you into that? Um, so what was it that about the Sea Scrolls that got me into it? Well, like I said, uh, it was very much the canon, I think. The fact that the Dead Sea Scrolls um, had extra books in the canon. And then on top of that, I was also looking into the manuscripts of scripture, differences in the manuscripts. Um, while I was in high school in 12th grade, I was really struggling with differences between the Septuagint and the Masoretic and the Samaritan copies of the Law of Moses, because there were some major differences in those manuscripts. And that was very distressing to me, because I was like, well, if there are these type of manners of variants, how could anything in scripture be trusted? That's kind of what I was going through at the time. But then I realized that that these variants are not like it doesn't make scripture unreliable. It just makes it, you know, the, the, it, it makes it corrupted, but not entirely unreliable. You can still have the general picture of scripture. I have to, I, I'm, I'm logging into my old uh, Yahoo email account, which I pretty much never use anymore, but I need, uh, I need the password to log, or I need a, a code to log in. So I'm, that's what I'm typing right now. Okay, so the way I find it is cultivate. Um, wait, let's see. And what would be our next question as I'm still looking this up? So what kind of, uh, due to all this uh, knowledge you've attained studying this, uh, these uh, various books and uh, digging in the Dead Sea Scrolls, what, what kind of controversial, controversial beliefs do you now hold? That is a very good question. Mm. Maybe we'll save that one for later because uh, you have, an, I'm sure, an exhaustive answer for it, right? <laughs> <laughs> that could be for part two, if you want. Oh, we're doing part two? I don't know. If this ends up breaking up into two segments, we'll see. Yeah. But I oh, do have, I have, another, I have, so one of the questions I want to know was, uh, was there anything in particular that you've come across while studying the Dead Sea Scrolls and uh, that that's why it's not uh, commonly held in a, uh, like a Christian church nowadays. Not commonly studied, like why pastors and preachers and priests aren't uh, all excited about them. Um, well, first of all, I actually think a lot of people are very much excited about the Dead Sea Scrolls because they are deceived of what they actually mean, of the implications. So. A lot of people will say the Dead Sea Scrolls prove that the, that the Bible is preserved perfectly and that it hasn't been changed. When you, if you actually look at the Dead Sea Scrolls, it says the exact opposite. So I would say that most people for, who talk about the Dead Sea Scrolls typically will do so like with the Isaiah Scroll. They'll mention the Isaiah Scroll, the complete copy of Isaiah is so close to our modern Hebrew copies that it shows the Bible is reliable and hasn't been changed. That's often what you'll hear from pastors. So I actually would say that they don't 
if they knew if they knew the Dead Sea Scrolls actually indicated, then they probably would shy away from it. But I think in general they're so ignorant about the Dead Sea Scrolls, they actually they actually uh, like it a lot. In my in, in my impression, because they think it supports their faith very much. Interesting. And, I know one of the things I thought that was really uh, interesting about the Dead Sea Scrolls is how it was uh, kept hidden for over 40 years. Right. That, well, it, it was, I, I do think that's a slight, um, I think it's a slight uh, misrepresentation, only in the sense that it wasn't, I don't personally believe, some people believe it was a conspiracy to conceal the truth. I don't think that was the case. The way it was is I, as a, a scene, I don't believe in the concept of copyright. Unfortunately, the scholars do. And so the scholars didn't want it to be released because they were concerned about their financial uh, profits off of their work. And they didn't want other people to claim fame to what their work was doing so it was cut it was more of an ego thing it wasn't like trying to hide the truth and it was slowly being published but yeah it, it was taking forever and then finally it was all published due to the efforts of people who believed that the public needed to have this stuff so that is very good that 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 happened that that it was finally released I agree. So uh, what's your favorite book and passage that's uh, found in the Dead Sea Scrolls? What do you like most in there? So my favorite passage in particular is, well, my favorite book actually is the Temple Scroll. I think that's the most important book of all the Dead Sea Scrolls because it's the it shows that the Torah, the law of Moses itself has been radically changed. And the original was much longer. So a lot of people are not familiar with this, but you know, so, uh, us people who are trying to follow the Torah, we want to know all the laws, right? Well, according to the Dead Sea Scrolls, the, the, the law of Moses, which mu was much longer than originally. And, and so the fact that it was much longer is just mind blowing. And it's, it's, there's so many implications of it. It changes everything. Um, it's, like what, what do we not have? It's just, it opens so many questions and it's, it's the foundation. It really is the foundation of scripture. So the fact that our foundation is so mangled is very troublesome, but it's very, it's motivating. It motivates me to do my Bible project because there's so much that people don't know because of these changes. Like, you know, the law of Moses, people rely on, rely on it so much for their bedrock of their faith. But if they only knew what the original Torah said, they would be blown away and, and they and many of the things they believe would be proven false if they simply had access to that original Torah. And a good chunk of the original Torah has survived in the temple school, but not the whole thing. One of my goals and plans is to reconstruct the, the original law using the Dead Sea Scrolls so the Temple Scroll is my favorite book because of that. And it has some extra laws that we're supposed to keep that are not in our copies of scripture. And the most important or the passage I most enjoy in particular is the law of the king. How, are you familiar with that, Emerson? I don't recall that. So in Deuteronomy, it says that 
in chapter 17. I mean, let, let's go there right now to chapter 17 of Deuteronomy. I'm, I'm loading it in Bible Gateway. So one sec as it loads. Okay, so it says, verse 14. What's the passage again? Uh, chapter 17, verses 14. All right. When you come to the land which the Lord your God is giving you and possess it and dwell in it and say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me, you shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses. From among your brethren you shall set as king over you. You may not set a foreigner over you who is not your brother, but he shall not multiply horses for himself nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. For the Lord has said to you, you shall not return that way again. Neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. And it shall be, when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write for himself a copy of this law in a book from before the priests, the Levites, and it shall be with him. And he shall read it all the days of his life. And he may learn to fear the Lord his God and be careful to observe all the words of this law and these statutes. That his heart may not be lifted above his brethren. That he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left. And that he may not, excuse me, and that he may prolong his days in his kingdom. He and his children in the midst of Israel. So that's the passage, and in that passage says, he shall write for himself a copy of this law in a book. So what, right away, what do you think this law is referring to? Torah, the Torah. The Torah as in? Uh, the first five books of the Bible. Okay, that's what a lot of people say. Also, some people might say it's just the book of Deuteronomy. Right. However, however, this passage was found in the Temple School. And it was found in a much longer form. And I'm going to read that. Unfortunately, it's frag some of it's fragmentary, so it's not all preserved. But enough of it is preserved to give you an idea of the original. So let me just get to that passage. The book number for scroll in the Dead Sea Scrolls is 11Q19. If you have the Dead Sea Scrolls on hand, you can follow along. If not, you can just listen as I read. So, let's see. Okay, so here's the passage. Column, column 56. When you enter the land which I give you and take possession of it and live in it and say, I shall set a king over myself like all the peoples which surround me. Then you shall set over yourself a king whom I shall choose. From among your brothers you shall set over yourself a king. You shall not set over yourself a foreign man who is not your brother. Only he shall not multiply the cavalry to himself or make the people go back to Egypt on account of war in order to multiply to himself the cavalry and the silver and the gold. And I told you, you shall not go back again on this path. And he shall not multiply wives to himself, lest they turn his heart away from me. 
He shall not multiply silver and gold, not too much. And when he sits upon the throne of his kingdom, they shall write for him his law, according to the book, which is before the priests. Okay, and then, and then it breaks off there. And then it says, and this is the law, the priests. On the day when they proclaim him king, they shall muster the children of Israel from 20 years old to 60 years old, according to their banners. And he shall appoint at their head chiefs of thousands, chiefs of hundreds, chiefs of fifties, and chiefs of tens in all their cities. And he shall select for himself a thousand of them, a thousand from each tribe to be with him, 12,000 men of war who shall not leave him alone and will be seized by the hands of the nations. And all the selected whom he has selected shall be men of truth, God fearers, enemies of bribery, skilled men in war, and they shall continuously be with him day and night. And they shall guard him from every act of sin and from the foreign nations so that he does not fall into their hands. And twelve princes of his people shall be with him, and twelve priests and twelve Levites, who shall sit together with him for judgment and for the law. And he shall not rise his heart above them, nor shall he do anything in all his counsels outside of them. And he shall not take a wife from among all the daughters of the nations, but instead take for himself a wife from his father's house, from his father's family. And he shall take no other wife in addition to her, for she alone will be with him all the days of her life. And if she dies, he shall take for himself another from his father's house, from his family. And he shall not pervert justice, and he shall not accept a bribe to pervert righteous judgment. And he shall not crave a field, a vineyard, any wealth, a house, or any valuable thing in Israel, and seize about five, six lines are missing, and then it says, they're men. And if the king hears that some nation or people is attempting to steal from anything which belongs to Israel. He shall send for the chiefs of thousands and the chiefs of hundreds, those stationed in the cities of Israel, and they shall send with him the tenth part of the people to go out with him to war against their enemies, and they shall go out with him. And if a large host enters the land of Israel, they shall send with him a fifth part of the men of war. And if it is a king with chariots and horses and many men, they shall send with him a third part of the men of war. And the other two divisions shall guard their cities and their borders so that no horde will enter their land. And if the war worsens for him, they shall send him half the people, the men of the army, but they shall not remove the half of the people from their cities. And if they overcome their enemies and defeat them and put them to the sword, they shall gather their spoils and from it they shall give to the king its tithe, to the priests one thousandth, and to the Levites one hundredth of the whole. And they shall divide the rest between those who fought in battle and their brothers who had to remain in their cities. And if he goes out to war against his enemies, a fifth part of the people shall go out with him, the men of war, all mighty men of valor. And they shall guard themselves from every unclean thing and from every shameful thing and from every iniquity and guilt. And they are not to go forth until he has entered before the high priest and he has consulted for him the decision of the Urim and Thummim. On his orders he shall go out, and on his orders he shall enter, he and all the children of Israel who are with him. He shall not go out on the advice of his heart until he has consulted the decision of the Urim and Thummim. And he shall have success in all his paths, as he has gone out according to this decision, which another six lines or so are missing, and then it continues and says, they shall disband them over many lands, and they shall be there a byword and a gibe, and under a heavy yoke, and under lack of everything. And there they shall worship gods made by the hands of man, wood and stone, silver and gold. And during all this, their cities shall become a waste, and a mockery, and a ruin, and their enemies shall be appalled at them. And they themselves in the lands of their enemies shall sigh and scream under a heavy yoke. And they shall call, but I shall not listen. They shall shout, but I shall not reply to them because of the evil of their deeds. And I will hide my face from them. And they shall be fodder and prey and spoil. 
and no one will save them because of their wickedness. For they broke my covenant, and their soul loathed my law, so that they became guilty of all wrongdoing. Afterwards, they shall come back to me with all their heart and with all their soul, in agreement with all the words of this law. And I will save them from the hand of their enemies and redeem them from the hand of those who hate them and bring them into the land of their fathers. And I shall redeem them and multiply them and rejoice in them. And I shall be their God and they shall be my, shall be my people. And the king who prostitutes his heart and his eyes from my commandments shall have no one who will sit on the throne of his fathers never because I shall prevent forever his descendants from governing again in Israel. But if he walks according to my precepts and keeps my commandments and does what is right and good before me, he shall not lack any one of his sons to sit on the throne of the kingdom of Israel forever. And I shall be with him and free him from the hand of those who hate him and from the hand of those who seek to destroy his life. And I shall give to him all his enemies and he shall rule them at his will, but they shall not rule him. And I shall place him above and not below, at the head and not, the, not at the tail, that he will extend his kingdom for many days, he and his sons after him. So that's a long passage. But that is my favorite passage from the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, because of how powerful it is. That's the original law that's being referred to in Deuteronomy that the king's supposed to write for himself. The Temple Scroll. It's, yeah, it's found in the Temple Scroll. So do you think then uh, what uh, they're telling him that he's supposed to be meditating on is the actual Temple Scroll, which has all this in there? Not the Temple Scroll. The, that, that section for the kings, it's actually a book of laws for the kings. It's like, it's like a law book for kings, what I just read. I and the king's supposed to write out that section for himself. And he's supposed to, just kind of like you, how they write the tef, the uh they write the commandments and the phylacteries. It's kind of similar, except the king writes the entire law for the king for himself. He doesn't write the whole temple scroll, just the laws that are for the king I to see. follow. And th but there's amazing evidence throughout the entire Old Testament of this passage being authentic. There are so many references and allusions to this passage, it's unbelievable. There's references in 1 Samuel and in 2 Samuel. There's references in Nehemiah and it's all over. There's some amazing stuff that supports cool. that So it's the equivalent of uh, that Jude quoting from Enoch you're saying kind of thing? Yeah. So that, like I said, that's my... Uh, that's my favorite. That's pretty cool. Passage. Thanks for sharing that with us. And there's you so much, uh, so much some... more in the Temple Scroll as well that is just of, of similar caliber of amazing differences. Yeah, I remember watching uh, one of your videos on that, and it was pretty awesome. I could see how there could be so much learned from that. Now it sounded like you were going to ask a different. Uh, yeah, you film. mentioned earlier about uh, a Bible project. You want to talk more about that? So ever since I started focusing on the canon all those years ago, I basically came to conclude that uh, I need to make a version of the Bible to, that has all the books of scripture and that has the best manuscripts. And I, I concluded that the, the translation of the of the bible is itself flawed so i decided that i needed to make it my life mission to make a new version of the bible using the best manuscripts i can translating it afresh because i realized that in my study of the hebrew that the translations don't always accurately convey what the hebrew says so I wanted to create a literal, a more literal translation so people can know what the Hebrew actually says. Uh, so that's one of the main goals. And then another, the other thing is there's so many amazing differences in the manuscripts of the Bible, different books. So I have, 
I have some real insight into those variants that a lot of people don't have. And I think the way I would render those variants is very important because a lot of these variants, I believe, are truly part of the original text. And most people are not aware of these variants at all. And there's so many variants for the books of the Old Testament that this is an essential project to bring what the scripture actually says to people. Because so many people make doctrines out of the smallest little thing that the scripture says. So if people realized how much of the Bible is actually altered from the original text, hopefully it would refute some false doctrines and also humble people and make them you can still hear me? Yeah, that's interesting. So how many books are right now in the canon that you've come up with? Um, well, definitely over 200. Um, it depends how you count them, the problem of counting. But uh, I'm focusing in my Bible project, I'm gonna focus on the Old Testament first and only in the books of the Hebrew for the Old Testament uh, and the Septuagint, but basically, what I mean is only the books that have Hebrew manuscripts. So there's a lot of Apocrypha, which unfortunately don't have Hebrew manuscripts. I don't want to focus on those yet because those are harder to work on if you don't have the Hebrew text. So I'm going to start with the Old Testament. And that's what I'm working on right now. I've started the project. And we're, I'm going through. And you guys will find it some really amazing stuff in, in my version of the Bible. I'm using the Dead Sea Scrolls as one of the primary texts for variants. I'm also using the Septuagint and the Samaritan copies as well. So there's some really amazing readings that, that change ideas about passages completely. So there's just so much depth that people are missing. And I believe my Bible project is essential for bringing, restoring God's word to people and bringing lost truths to people that are now accessible for the first time. A lot of people say, why do you think you, you are capable of doing this when it's been thousands of years and people haven't done this? Well, the thing is, the Dead Sea Scrolls only came back to discovery in the last 100 years, less than that. And so that means almost the last 2,000 years, like, in other words, the people alive today are more capable of producing a more accurate version of the Bible than ever before because of, we have way more resources than the ancients ever did. We have manuscripts that they don't have, that they didn't have. We have tools that they didn't have, like uh, the internet, and it just allows us to be so much more efficient. We have strong concordance. We have all these expert books on scholarship of the language of Hebrew and Greek, and it's just so many resources. We can save time. We can just do it more efficiently. And we, like I said, we have far more superior scripts than the last 2000 years had. So I think that's why my bio project is important because it brings to light readings that were part of the original text, which were removed by scribes. So that's my basic take. Yeah, that's quite a big difference too from uh, 66, right in the common one now. Yeah. To 200. Yep. It's a lot that people are missing out. I've heard, I've heard. So what would you say to somebody that was like, oh, but you know, all I need is these 66 books. I'm not worried about, like, I just need what, uh, what, what God let come together. Well, I would say to them, you don't even need any, any of the Bible to be saved. You know, none of the Bible is necessary. You could throw out the entire Bible if you want to make that argument. Um, and then the other thing is, if you want to say some of the Bible is necessary, you could easily show that some books are not. Like Song of Solomon is literally a book about Solomon's uh, sexual enjoyment with, with his spouse. We don't need that. Uh, let's see here. 
we have three Gospels. Gospel of Mark is basically the same. The Gospel of Mark has no, pretty much doesn't have any unique information at all compared to the other Gospels. So you can, you can throw out Gospel of Mark. Uh, and if you just keep going through that process, you can just do that and eliminate a lot of the books of Scripture. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But if you go through the process of, okay, it's not about what's necessary for salvation. It's what helps people become saved. It's what encourages people to be saved, what leads people to salvation. The more books of, the more of his words we have, the more likely people can become saved. The less we have, the less likely people will become saved. And so that's the importance of it. Yes, you, you don't need them. But if you don't have them, you're at a serious disadvantage of ever knowing the truth and being saved, in my opinion. So um, I finally found the passage from my book that I was writing years ago, Philosophy, that I was... Uh, so all let, right let, let, let me uh read this this is a slightly long not too long but uh I, there were so many cool things that i that i came up with this but some of the things i did i now disagree with in this uh philosoph philosophy book but um But a lot of it still rings true to me. So hold on now. It's it's Yahoo Mail is not good. It, it freezes up all the time. Of course, it doesn't help that I have a bunch of tabs open. But uh, okay. <sighs> all right. As I'm trying to make this load. Um, were there other questions on our list? I know we had like 12 questions or something. 10 oh, yeah, questions. we've been hitting them. We don't have much left. So what tell is, us about your uh, community goal. You mentioned about how you uh, wanted to, as an Essene, live in a community. Yes. So the Essenes believe in co community. And this, the Essenes taught something basically the same as you see in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4. It's also the same thing that a, a modern group does, which is the group is called the 12 tribes. And basically the idea is sharing all things with each other, living together as a com community, a commune. And the ancient believers did it of the, of the Messiah and the Essenes did it. And these apocryphal books tell us that that is what we're supposed to be doing. It's not supposed, it's not something which is, is a suggestion or that we can if we want. We, we are required to do it. We are to seek a community. And then once we find the community, we are supposed to then share what we have with that community and live as a community together. So I want to live as an Essene. I want to live as a, as a true believer. So in order to do that, I need a group. I need a group. I need a community. So I hope to have that someday, and I want to create one for myself. My plan currently is to buy a house and then to start inviting some people to live there, excuse me, and to pay rent. But the rent is more of like a membership fee, and that membership fee will then be used to cover everybody's expenses, including yours. So let's say it's $1,000 for every month. That fee will then get you, it'll give you room and board. You can eat anything that's in my fridge, you can eat as long as you're eating it and not throwing it out. Uh, you Anything in my wardrobe, my clothes, you can wear my clothes. <laughs> yeah, you can uh, play my video games. You can watch my movies. You can listen to my music. Anything that is mine, you can use. The idea is to eventually have like, so one person would be like, okay, so normally it'd be like $1,000 a month for the membership fee, but there'd be like a few people, one or, if, if this really became a big thing, there'd be like one person who would be the, essentially the butler, if you will, where 
he will drive everybody around where they need to go. If someone needs to go somewhere, he'll drive you there. Um, he'll basically be the chauffeur. And the car will be provided by me. So it'll be my car. He'll drive it around. And, you know, I'll, I'll give him the fee, the fare to pay for gas and everything. Although, actually, I probably want him to have an electric car or like a solar powered or whatever. It'd, it'd probably be alternate energy. But anyway, uh, so whatever the expenses for the car would be, I would cover it because it would be my car. I'm sharing the car with the community. But the car would, would bring people where they need to go. If they need to get to go to work, the car would bring them to work. The person driving. Uh, then that same person would come home and he would start doing certain chores. Like he, you know, this wouldn't be required of like, if people didn't want him to do it, they could do it themselves. But basically he would do people's laundry. If they want him to do laundry, he would do the laundry. He would clean up the areas. I say he, it could be a she too, but it doesn't matter really. Whoever is the one they would clean up at, and do various chores at home, at our at our uh, community building. And he would make food for us. Like he would actually make the, the, the meals, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. But those would be optional. You wouldn't have to eat what he's making. You could make something for yourself. But in the interest of having a community meal, it'd be nice for everybody to eat the same thing together. So those are some of my ideas that I have, and uh, it would be in fulfillment of what the Messiah says, where we would work together, we would come together, pool our resources together. I would then take everybody's, I would take everybody's membership fees. First, I would use that money to pay for everyone's expenses for that month. And then whatever money is left over, I would take that and put it into basically what I regard as community fund, but it'd be my, it would under the, under the legal definition, it'd be my money, but in the eyes of God, it'd be everybody's money. I'd be sharing with everybody, but it'd be the community money where I would be investing it in the stock market and building up the money to make more and more money for our community so we can do more and more things. And one of the projects I would like to do eventually when I have when, when I have more than a million dollars saved up is I want to start doing, uh, I want to start funding water for third world areas that need water. I've heard about, uh, I've heard about uh, ministries or uh, outreaches which provide clean water to entire cities or entire villages. But of course, they need to have people donate for that to happen. So I would like it to be on a regular basis, if possible, every month to, to, to have, um, to fund a village for their water. I'd have to check the price on that, if it, depending how expensive that is. It might not be every month because it might be too expensive, but that's the idea. Like, you know, trying to do these projects to help people. Um, so yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. There's a lot more to it than that, but oh, Melissa must have gotten out. I didn't realize this whole time. Uh, let's see, is she back in now? But yeah, that's the community uh, concept that I have. It sounds and, interesting. I've not heard that kind of concept before. Yeah. And if you want, you can make an advanced. Uh, you can make make an advanced deposit right now, and uh, I will gladly take it. <laughs> of course, I'm just being silly, but uh, but anyone anyone who's serious about it, though, they could do an advanced thing in in a sense of like um, like I've mentioned to someone before, like it's a it's a thousand dollar. It would I could make it lower, but for now, I'm thinking a thousand, but like I said, it might be lower. Um, but let's say it's just a thousand. So someone could say, you know what? A thousand a month is twelve thousand a year. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pay two thousand a month for one year. Then, 
after I do 2000 a month for a year, the whole following year, I don't have to pay anything for 12 months straight. Some people might prefer that. Some people might prefer to be do bigger payments so that they don't have to do payments later on. Another thing is if you lose your job, like let's say you have a job because you, you'll need a job to be able to pay to get $1,000 a month. So let's say you come to where my house is and you find a job here. Well, first I would pay your ticket to come. I would pay your travel expenses to arrive on my property. Then I would cover your expenses until you find a job in the area. Then if you were to lose your job, like if you were to be fired or, or you have to quit for whatever reason, if it's a lot, if it's a fair reason, then I would be reasonable with you and say, okay, you know what? Just try to help out with things at home and your payments will be deferred where basically you don't have to worry about this. Um, so until you get a job again, don't worry about the payments. We'll, we'll make you covered because it would not be, it would be cruel to say, oh, you lost your job. By the way, we're going to kick you out now because you can't pay a thousand dollars. Yeah, right. That's, That's true. not fair. So but then you, do they have to go into that butler mode? <laughs> not necessarily. <laughs> if they did the butler mode, then they wouldn't have to pay. Uh, but if they if they if they still wanted to pay, but just couldn't until they get a job, they would basically be given. They would essentially be given a loan, but I would immediately take their loan from them. <laughs> until, what if they're, until they're uh, in their room playing video games all day, and then you have to put them in. <laughs> Incentivize. <laughs> Hopefully, you have responsible people. And you don't have to worry about that stuff. <laughs> yeah, basically, it, it would kind of be like if it's clear that they're not being serious and they're not looking for work, then they'd probably have to be kicked out. Um, it, but they that probably they, would be the hardest part is having to make that choice to yeah get somebody to that be. that is tough to do that. Oh, um, it still says Melissa's connecting for some reason. I don't know why. Anyway, so um, that is an idea that I hope to do someday, but it may not happen. Or if it does, it might not be as big as I'd like it to be. But we shall see. So is that something you can see yourself doing in the next 10 to 20 years? Next 10 to 20 years, definitely. Um, next five is not clear. So is that what would is that like uh would you say your that and your Bible projects are the two biggest things you're focusing on? Yes. Oh, those are my big ones. The other one is trying to find a wife and start a family. And for me, this might seem a little bit selfish, but that starting a family is a priority for me over not the Bible project. The Bible project is actually more important to me than starting a family. But um, having a family is actually more important to me than starting this community idea. I guess that would throw a wrench in things, right? If you had a wife and kids or... It wouldn't, it wouldn't necessarily. It depends. Um, it depends on how close you're living in the community, I guess, too. Like, Yeah. But, sharing the kitchen or sharing the bathroom, like that would be... Uh... <laughs> well, well, the other thing is like, let's say I marry someone and they say, no, no one's allowed in our house. Well, then I couldn't do community. Uh, or if I try to go against my wife, she might, uh, you know, threaten divorce or whatever. Hopefully, I wouldn't marry a woman that's petty like that. That's my thought, exactly. Uh, <laughs> you got to find a sweet one, man. Yeah. So anyways, um, all right, let me read this passage from one my... One with from, compassion. Ah, uh, yes, that would be lovely. Philosophy book time. All right, let's hear this. Much anticipated. So this section is called The Base Mind Reveals the Meaning of Life. Metaphysical is superior to the physical. The vanity of amorality. The mind seeks to find something meaningful, but whoa, what is meaningful? Is anything important at all? If nothing is important, why should I care? The life of amorality is a life focused on pleasure and pain. But woe, pleasure and pain is in all things. We cannot escape pleasure and pain. What then 
Shall pleasure give us meaning and importance? If so, what pleasure shall we seek? Is not all pleasure a moment's passing? It comes and goes in the wind and accomplishes nothing. In amorality, pleasure satisfies in the briefest of times and leaves a feeling of emptiness and wanting more. We will never be satisfied because we will always be void of pleasure for pleasure will continue to flee from us. Shall I choose a certain pleasure? Is one pleasure better than the other? And what is the gauge? If all pleasure is the same, then does it not matter what pleasure we choose? But if the pleasure we choose does not matter, then why choose it? Further, in order to get pleasure, so much pain must be endured, but the pain is not worth it, for it is endless pain. Endless cycles of pain and pleasure. When will it end? In amorality, it will end at the end of your life. And so you will never find the pleasure you desire, for it will be withheld from you. Why live? The darkness of life has no value if there is no meaning to it. That is, if there is no importance to it. That sounds very much like Solomon, right? That's because I was actually trying to um, imitate some of what Solomon was saying to, because I related to it very much. So I said, such is my attempt to imitate my own comments uh, on the vanity of immorality. Uh, I, I think I meant to say of Solomon. But who better than Solomon himself, the wise, to demonstrate the vanity of immorality? I will attempt to summarize his argument below. And then I, I read like a summary of, of Ecclesiastes, a, a very small paragraph. Uh, and then I say, now I shall explain the source of how I came to discover the meaning of life. It was by studying the base mind. I started thinking about my place in the scheme of things and how it seemed that there was no point in life in isolation. Picture a human in solitary confinement. Picture a human abandoned alone on an island. What of the human that has locked-in syndrome? Worse, the locked-in syndrome, hum, excuse me, the, the locked-in human that is withheld from all communication. And what of the deaf-blind human? What of the mind that has absolutely zero sensory perception? So what if you were born with no, no ability to hear, no ability to see, or touch, or taste, or smell? What if you had no, none of your senses, but you had your mind, and you were born that way, and you were hooked up to a feeding tube so that you didn't die? So you would wake up every day, but you wouldn't see, hear, smell, uh, taste, touch, anything. So what would your mind think about, if anything at all? Would your mind have thoughts? What would it think about, right? All right. So I, I just said that off the top of my head to explain what I'm talking about. That's not in my text right here. But so now continuing. For I saw that these questions sought to capture the true essence of the meaning of life. For life in its most basic and pure part is simply that of consciousness. Thus, the question of the meaning of life is really asking what is the purpose of consciousness? Now, it is evident that the meaning of consciousness is not contingent upon the physical. For is not each of the senses merely a means of gaining further things that one already has as a base mind? By base mind, I mean the mind void of all sensory perception and thus void of all external communication. For what does the sense of sight yield us? Surely it merely gives us further knowledge. And what is this knowledge? The knowledge is regarding the existence of something. In this specific case, the existence of light. And so is not knowledge present without the physical things? For what is the self? Uh, let me say for a second. The fact that you can't, see, some people are born blind means you, you don't need to see things in order to have meaning of life. The fact that some people are deaf means you don't have to hear things to have the meaning of life. The fact that some people cannot touch, do not have a sensation of touch, means you don't have to touch anything to have the meaning of life. So all these things, the senses, are not necessary for the meaning of life. Again, that's my, that's my, that's what I'm adding right now. Okay, so 
And then I say, for what is the self? Is not the self the awareness, but self is not a physical thing. And yet one is aware of the self and awareness is part of knowledge. And thus physical senses do not add anything of which a counterpart is not already found in a more basic form in the base mind. And thus the meaning of life is not contingent on physical things. What is more, or this is what I just said, what is more, sight, sound, and touch are all withheld from conscious individuals, and yet consciousness persists. And even then, those individuals can enjoy life and are in the same lot as all of the non-disabled. Further, let us take the example of the man abandoned, lost and alone on an, on an island. This man is almost always miserable. Just watch the movie Castaway. That, that example, Castaway, is a callback to the, when I used it in this book. So I said, just watch the movie Castaway. For what is the meaning of his life? That is the main character's life. It is obvious that his senses do not give him the meaning of life. For if the meaning were found in physicality, then he should be fulfilled and have it in his isolation. And yet he does not have it. And we know why this is. It is because we are seeking the meaning of consciousness. And consciousness is not a physical thing. And thus, because it is not a physical thing, if there is nothing metaphysical, then there is no meaning of life. Thus we see that the physical is irrelevant to the meaning of life and that the meaning of life is found exclusively in the realm of the metaphysical. And it is obvious that the physical cannot even exist without the metaphysical for it is the metaphysical that gives meaning to the physical in the first place, since the physical is also metaphysical. And I, I shall demonstrate that identity of the physical in full at a later point in this book. I'm not going to read that part, but that's what I say in the book. And then I say, at any rate, it is thus demonstrated that we are seeking something metaphysical that is not physical for the meaning of life. Upon realizing that the meaning of life must exist in the base mind, it disturbed me as I could not think what possible meaning such a mind could have even though an advanced mind is virtually the same as a base mind in regards to what that meaning would be. However, after many periods of great tormenting of my mind, in seeking for the truth and narrowly avoiding being destroyed by depression, I had an extended amount of sleep. And finally, when I woke up for the third time that day on the Sabbath of April 16th, that would be 2000. Uh, 2011, I had a revelation my, in my thoughts and thus found the meaning of life. The meaning of life I found is as follows. The meaning of life is to find the meaning of life, aka to know the plan of God. It's also to know who God is, to praise thus worship God, to love life, to increase as much as possible in the fullness, to train your righteousness by cycling through the knowledge you have and gaining new knowledge of possible, for refining and strengthening, to love slash help others, to make friends with the righteous, to love yourself and to enjoy art. And that is the meaning of life. Oh, you're muted. That sounds nice. Yeah, so that was a long introduction to that meaning of life, but you can tell I was being very philosophical. Yeah, you were in deep contemplation. Yeah, that's how I felt during that time in my life. It was just very dark. And I needed to philosophize about these things in order to be sane. So what were, any other questions did we leave? Uh, I know there that's was a, the controversial one. Yep, that's everything but that one. Okay, so the controversial, my most controversial beliefs my one most controversial belief what what would you consider that to be that's a tough one because i'm gonna have to narrow it down to three okay so first i believe that we have to be sinless to be saved and if we sin even once after salvation we lose our salvation and can never get it back that might be the that might be pretty controversial right number right. two Number two is my belief that 
in addition to the Sabbath, Sunday is also a Sabbath day that we're supposed to keep. Uh, so both Saturday and Sunday are holy Sabbath days. That's controversial. And that's included in a new law of the new covenant where a whole new book of the law gives the laws for the new covenant. Okay, I'll say four. The, the third thing is I'm a communist because the Essenes uh, teach community and I believe communism is the principle for all people and that it is the correct government system. Uh, I don't think, a lot of people say, well, yeah, that's, that's true only in a theocracy. But for me, I don't believe in communism just for theocracy. I believe in communism for everybody, for government, for everything. Uh, I think that's the way to go. And so that definitely makes me out of line with a lot of believers, because a lot of believers think communism is evil liberalism, godless liberalism, and you know, socialism and all that evil stuff. But I think if you read the scriptures, it's very clear that the Messiah teaches communism. And I, and I think it's illogical and it's kind of like, it's kind of like, it's a loophole, a justification to, to get out of communism to say, oh, well, yeah, in a theocracy, it's communism. But when we're not in a theocracy, we can do capitalism and, and, and not help people and stuff. You know, that to me doesn't make much sense. It definitely needs to be balanced. Yeah. And then the final thing, can you guess what my final thing is? It's had to do with Hashatan. Uh, what, what, Mestamia. We, what would you say about that? Oh, is it the L and Yah? It's the Baal thing. <laughs> um, but every, oh, everything, everything about... Uh, Everything about the Babylonians and Canaanites that I've come to conclude over the last, uh, since 2019, basically, there are many gods. Um, all the gods are real beings. They're not fake, like Zeus and all these other ones. They actually did exist. Not only that, I believe a lot of the gods are, in fact, identified with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So... For example, the Messiah, I believe the Messiah is, I believe the Messiah is Yahweh. Like Jesus, Yeshua, he's Yahweh. But I also think he's Baal. I think he's Enki. He's Ea. Zeus. Jupiter. Um, Thor. So that sounds, that's a pretty controversial belief, um, All right. but I have evidence for it, a good reason to think of it. And I have compelling evidence in scripture that Yahweh is Baal. And I know that sounds heretical. I know it sounds blasphemous to a lot of people who hear this for the first time. If you're watching this video, I ask you to give me a chance on this and watch my video on YouTube entitled, Proof that Baal, that Yahweh is Baal. It's two out. It's like a little. It's a, it might be like three hours or something. But but then it wouldn't. It, when uh, I think of uh, when El, was an Eliyah, Eliyah, who took on the prophets of Baal. Like, wouldn't that then have been like a house divided against itself? It, um, I believe his name was originally Belia, <laughs> and. Um, and also, I think I think it's a it's a more complicated story than that. I think the scribes change the story a little bit. I think instead, you have you have the true Baal versus the fake Baals that they're worshiping. The fake Baals will be the idols, because in ancient times, idols were not considered separate gods by most people. The idols were considered representations and conduits to the real God. So if you wanted to say, say you wanted to worship Yahweh and you believe in, let's say you believe in idolatry, which, you know, we know is, we know is a sin, but in the ancient times, not everybody believed it was a sin. So let's say you're an ancient Yahweh worshiper and you want to, and you have an idol, 
you want to make an idol of Yahweh. So you make an idol. You're looking at this idol and you believe in your heart that if you pray to this statue of Yahweh, it, Yahweh will hear your prayer because the statue has ears and Yahweh has decided that he will put his ears into that statue so that when you pray to that statue, Yahweh hears it and he'll receive those prayers through the statue. So the statue is almost like a uh, phone a phone line you're using. So idol, I, idols are basically phone lines if you want to modernize it in comparison. The, the ancients believed that idols were basically phone lines to contact the, the divine gods and communicate with them and give them their worship through the idol. That's the way the idolaters viewed it. That's not the way God, Yahweh, views it. The way he views it is, even though you think this is me that you're talking to, you have created a false god, and you are worshiping a false god. And so because of this, this false god that you call Yahweh, do not worship Yahweh. Do not worship that Yahweh. Worship this Yahweh. I am the Yahweh you are to worship. Do not worship those Yahwehs. Oh, interesting. So in the same way, in the context of Baal, Yahweh comes, you know, Baal means master. And so he he appears to Elijah and says, I am Baal. Those idols are not Baals. Tell them to stop worshiping those Baals. And if they refuse, then they are to be destroyed. So it's a whole battle between the idols of Baal and Baal himself. And what's interesting is Baal was considered the god of the storm. And one of the powers of the storm is to control rain, right? Well, what did Elijah do? He withheld the rain for three years because they were worshiping the idols of Baal. They were, they were sitting against the god of Baal, so Baal removed the rain. And then when the idols and the idol worshipers were destroyed, the rain comes back. So Baal sends the rain again to the people because they had repented from their sinful worship. Um, that's my belief. And there's a lot more to it than that. But of course, th that might be the most controversial belief I have, actually. The whole Baal. Thing. I know one more that came to my mind is... Uh... What you think if uh, we found the dead, if we found the Ark of the Covenant and we were miraculously able to open it up and we found, were able to somehow handle the tablets that were written on front and back with the Decalogue, what <laughs> language would they be written in? Right. Um, it would be like a, it would be like some type of Akkadian dialect, essentially in my belief. It basically, I, it basically said, be uh, in like cuneiform at one point in time. Well, cuneiform is just uh, letters. It, it's not a language. It, it comes from the Babylonian or the Sumerians, but cuneiform was used to write the Sumerian language. It was used to write the Akkadian language. It was used to write Persian and Hittite and a bunch of other languages. It's just like just like the, the uh, Latin alphabet, which comes from Hebrew. So the Hebrew alphabet was borrowed by Greeks, borrowed by Latins. So the Latin language uses it. Then all the Romance languages use the Latin alphabet. The Armenians took the Greek alphabet and put it into Armenian. The, the Egyptians, the Coptics, they took the Greek alphabet and made it their letters for the Egyptian. They replaced hieroglyphics with the Greek letters. Um, English takes, takes the Latin alphabet. So when, you, when we say cuneiform, that's just the way it was written. That's not the language. Um, but I, so it was written in cuneiform and it was written in an earlier dialect of Hebrew that basically I believe was a archaic form of Akkadian or Assyrian or Babylonian. So yeah, Babylonian, the original Babylonian language of the law of Moses, that would be considered controversial as well.
It'd be interesting. And I guess you could say the Torah, the fact that the Torah is completely mangled and the original Torah was much longer and different than our current copies. That's probably a lot of people would that find can that, get in that category too, really yeah. controversial. <laughs> yeah. So, there's just so many things. I could think of so many things. You know, another one is I believe animals and plants are spiritual beings that can sin. And if they don't be righteous, they'll go to hell just like humans and they have to repent of their sins to be saved. So then you think that there's going to be animals in heaven or what they call the renewed heavens and renewed earth and yeah, I think they, they like would be the same animal, like your dog, Fido, or whatever. When it passes <laughs> away, you're saying you're going to see again in the afterlife? No, I don't know if I will because their judgment is known to, to God, not for me. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't assume all dogs go to heaven. You know, some, some might not. <laughs> you, you, you hope for it, but at the same time, it doesn't make sense for pets to get guaranteed into heaven, but humans don't get guaranteed into heaven. That would not be fair. It would not be fair for the majority of humans to go into eternal torments, but all animals get saved automatically because they they couldn't know better. Well, if that's the case, then why didn't God make it so that all humans were so dumb that they all become saved, right? And I always you, figured that we had a freedom of choice, but the animals kind of don't, that they act on instinct and... But if you think about it, there's just so much of life, like so many animals and creatures that it just defies, when you really start thinking about it, is this whole animal world just for us? It doesn't make much sense. Like it, if you start thinking about it, there's a whole world that seems to be exists for the sake of the animals and not for us. Like, like for example, the water creatures, um, we have barely went into the depths of the waters, the oceans. Yeah. But there's life there since the beginning of time that has been untouched, practically. And Antarctica, we, we, we barely have anyone in Antarctica throughout the history of our, of our time on Earth. And yet animals right. have lived there for thousands of years. So there's just so many, like you, you look up how, how many insects exist how many chickens how many this that this that there's so much life that exists it just they have there has to be a greater purpose for their existence than just to serve as a means to an end for humans i think they exist i think humans are just animals in the same way animals are we're just you know according to jubilees animals could speak until the fall of right. man so we were the same we were all the same my views on plants is less supported in scripture, but there's there's evidence in scripture, but it's less less compelling than the animals, but there's still some good evidence of that. Like the idea that plants are actually conscious and well, what about rocks then? It talks about rocks crying out. The molecule, like the, the parts that make up the rocks are alive, but not the rocks themselves. So like so imagine you have a lake. And you split the lake in half. Does it become two different souls? No. Instead, it's not the lake that's alive. It's all the tiny little particles of water that each of them are alive. They're each like an angel. Each of the particles are like angels. And together, they form a composite unity. Um, but, but they move together as a group. But they are not one single entity. They are millions and millions of or billions or however many of tiny microorganism angelic beings that constitute water and they those small beings are the ones that cry out in my belief interesting yeah so ready to convert i my, always keep my uh i like my to learn. religion convert I don't, I, I consider, uh, I'm not a very religious individual. I consider myself to have a relationship. I don't like to be labeled either. So it's like, I don't, I and just then, consider myself a follower of the way. Enter the relationship. <laughs> Come enter our relationship. <laughs> no, I'm just well, I've enjoyed our relationship and yeah. I've definitely enjoyed getting to know you more over these uh, past couple hours and appreciate you sharing and opening up to us. Yeah, sorry, sorry if it was a little bit uh, long-winded here. 
I know it was, uh, we started at nine, it's been two hours now, but we finished our questions. I hope, I hope yes, you've enjoyed did. it. Ho I, I did, I hope you did too. Hopefully this recording comes out okay. Yeah, that's the next thing. If it doesn't, then we'll have to do it all over again. <laughs> I'm just joking. Thank you, thank you, Sister Laura. Yeah, here too. Yeah, and thank you. Yeah, she left earlier, but she had to go, I guess. But yeah. Um, and Melissa got kicked out at one point, but this is being recorded, so I will try to upload it. You missed the most interesting parts of controversial beliefs. You'll have to hear that later. Um, but it's been, it was it was fun. I enjoyed the discussion. Maybe we'll have to do what you said what you suggested of possibly interviewing other people like Laura if she's interested we could interview her for the Ahad group Melissa we could interview this yeah I'm a, I believe everybody this. has something unique and special about them and that they should I think that uh you know but I think not everybody is at the same level of uh, sharing and opening up and yeah. recording it and putting it out there for the world to see this so. Emerson guy he's got something to share I love to serve and help others. <laughs> I'm glad to get to know you more and do some, do our Q, the help out in the Q and A's on, you know, Would, would anyone, uh, would you want to do a Q and A focused on you sometime or not a Q and A, a interview where Jackson or I interview you and find out who you really are? I'm not that interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that settles it. We'll do it sometime. <laughs> we'll see. Or you know what? It might be better to do like a panel, like for some. Oh, that would be fun. Like in other words, what I mean is interviewing multiple people instead of it being focused on one person for the entire one hour, two hours. You could have like four or five people, kind of like asking a question to all of them, so that it's not. It doesn't feel like it's focused on. True. Can, that's, that's I like a way that idea. It. We'll I think, think that's about a good it. idea. Yeah, we'll, we'll we'll figure it out. All right, Shalom. Thank you for this opportunity. I appreciate it. My pleasure, Shalom, brother. Have a blessed one. We'll talk soon. Yeah, bless you all. Thanks again, Shalom, family.